Hello and welcome to India Speak, the podcast by the Center for Policy Research. I am Sushant Singh, Senior Fellow at Center for Policy Research. This podcast series features leading experts and academics on China and the many facets of Sino-India relations. Some of them, like Rana Mitter and Arunab Ghosh, have looked at the historical side of things, while others, like Taylor Frevel, have focused on the strategic facets. You can listen to all the previous episodes in this series for those conversations. But today, we'll be discussing China and Sino-India ties from a very different perspective a social, cultural, and political perspective of someone who knows China rather intimately, both personally and professionally. To do that, our guest today is Cindy Yu, the broadcast editor and China reporter for The Spectator in the UK. She is the host of the highly acclaimed and extremely popular Chinese Whispers podcast. She was born and brought up in Nanjing in China, where she did her early schooling before growing up in the UK. She has a master's in Chinese studies from Oxford University. Cindy, welcome to India Speak. Thank you so much for having me. Cindy, let me begin with something that you've spoken of, written about, a lack of information, nuance, and understanding of China in the West. And let me assure you that India is no better off in that aspect. We read Western scholars in reporting on China, and other than in the military and strategic aspects, have no real work of our own on Chinese society and politics in the modern era. For such an audience, what is the best way in which you can explain modern China or contemporary China? The uniqueness, the differences from developed countries like the US, UK or France, or or even from other developing countries like India? Well, Sushan, I I think to start with, you know, it's fascinating to me, um, as we talked a little bit about before we started recording, which is that, you know, you were saying that India gets so much of information about China through the West. So I I had never thought about it like that. You know, you would think that the two countries sharing a border would have more direct communication with each other, more direct Asian understanding of each other. But I'd never thought about the West as a filter between the two. So that's really fascinating to think about. And I think inevitably you will have West Western stereotypes and Western um, assumptions in that, given that's how the information is being translated. Um, I think the best way to understand uh, China in the way that Chinese people understand it is probably to think about it as not so different to other countries. So, you know, whether you're an Indian or whether you're Brit, whether you're American, you know that your country is an incredibly complicated place. You know that in your country, there are people on the left side, people on the right side. There are people who are more internationalist, people who are more nationalist. Um, You understand all of these things. And you also understand that there are just people who are not interested in politics at all. They just want to get on with their lives. They just want to have their families. They want to make sure that all everyone around them is good. They want to have, have their career. They want to have their education. And China is really not different from that. And what I see is one of the misconceptions in Western reporting about China is that people forget that people in China have these individual lives that will matter to them. So then, you know, you've got questions like, why would anyone go into the Chinese Communist Party? Well, you know, if you're a bright university student, that might be the best option for you. Uh, in in your career. So it's not a political ideological choice, but it is in the environment that you're in, the best career choice. And to understand that kind of, um, you know, all the different things that matter to you in in any individual's life also happens in China. So it's not necessarily political, it's just people being people and um, living the best way they can. So I think, yeah, to start with, I would say that people need to understand that China is not so different and Chinese people have their own lives. But I would also say that There is one key difference, which is China's recent history, which definitely weighs very, very heavily um, on the Chinese mentality, as I'm sure Rana Mitter talked about as well. Um, And Sushan, you know, from the Indian perspective, I'm sure it's very similar, where the last couple of hundred years of history, you can never get away from that. And that will weigh in on every single contemporary political decision or even non-political, just how individuals see the rest of the world as well, because you can't forget that. And I think a lot of the times I'm speaking to you from London, people in the UK have a different recent history, um, much more on the victor side, you might say. And that will have different, um, you know, bring out about different psyche um, and different assumptions as well. So I think you know, I think in that respect, India and China are probably quite similar in trying to come to grasp, come to grips with their recent history and what that means for modern politics. And that's something that the Americans and the Brits don't quite understand in nearly as much. 
Uh, but Cindy, let me put it slightly differently. When you go from London or, or from Europe back to back to China, even for a short visit or to meet your relatives, what is that one significant difference that strikes you? you know, as you land there, wherever in Beijing or wherever, what is that you say, "Oh man, this is this is it now." I think I'm actually always struck by when I spend too long in the West, as I you know I grew up in China and the and and London, and when I spend too long in London, I go back to China and I think. Oh my god! People here don't think that they're bad people. <laughs> people here don't think that China's bad. You know, it's um, it's really interesting because in the Western mindset, it's so easy to think about China in all of the negative ways. But in China, you know, if you're thinking about things, I actually find there's a lot of more of um cynicism about Chinese and global politics. So people might say, "Oh yeah, well, the Americans are doing that because of this realpolitik way." Whereas in London, we don't tend to think about things like that because Americans are our allies, and we never would cynically an- analyze their um, motives. Um, and then people in China don't think that they are the big bad um, in this, and then they they just you know what one one moment that struck me was when I watched this um, sci-fi film called um, Wandering Earth. And it's adapted from a book written by the man who wrote the Three Body Problem, which Obama had、yeah. rated as one of his books to read.、Um, and it's about this moment in the future where Earth has to be moved around, and、um, the Chinese in the film are why you know the Earth gets saved, basically. Which obviously you know every country would do that in their own film industry.、Um, interestingly, there was not any political thing at all. There was nothing communist about it. There was nothing、um, particularly anti-Western about it. But at the end, in the very final scene, when other nations needed to help, it was the Russians who came on board first, <laughs> <laughs> and then it was, and then it was the French,、um, and then you know I didn't even think Americans came to help at all, actually. So it's really interesting that it's a subtle ways in which you can see this from both sides, but the Chinese people in China don't. See them as the enemy, which sounds obvious, but、yeah. when you're there, it feels so depoliticized. They depoliticize a lot of the things that we politicize,、um, certainly in London. Cindy,、uh, how much of an interest in China is in India? You know, and I and I mean going beyond the current border crisis or what happened in 2020, summer of 2020, when some soldiers from both India and China died on the borders in Ladakh and etc.、Uh, before it, when you were in school, etc., you know, did did India matter at all? Or so, what did your family think of India? What what is it like? So I, growing up, we didn't talk much about India at all. We didn't learn much about India. We didn't think much about India.、Um, I think India fits in a particularly. It doesn't fit neatly in China's patriotic education, by which I mean, you know, its propaganda campaign.、Um, and your listeners will know that after the Tiananmen Square protest, the government thought, "Oh my God, we're training up a whole generation of young people who are not patriotic. They don't love the country, by which they mean they don't love this party and they don't love this government." So in the nineties, which is when I grew up, there was a renewed sense of、um, looking at the curriculum, looking at how we can make people more patriotic, and that's what I went through. But the way to do that was very much through the recent history, so the century of humiliation that the Chinese government talks about,、um, where it was basically、um, carved up, and、um, there were, you know, all sorts of different、um, incursions by, you know, various imperial powers. India was not one of them, so India never fit neatly into that narrative because you couldn't really accuse India of being a、um, You know, a bully for your recent history in the same way you could accuse the British, British or the Americans or the French.、Um, at the same time, you know, there was never that solidarity with India in the same way there was solidarity with like other post-colonial countries because India was still such a good ally of the UK. So you felt like, you know, when Mao was talking about his being the leader of the third world, it, he wanted India to be on side, but it always felt like India was actually had friendlier relationships with the rest. Didn't quite fit in on that narrative. So I think that's probably why we didn't learn much about it growing up in our very basic history lessons. It was only really moving to the UK where I would get,、um, you know, obviously the UK has such a large Indian population, but whenever I came into contact with someone who was、um, Pakistani, they would say, "Oh, you're Chinese, you know, we're we're old friends, you know," and then they would start making conversation, and that was when I realised coming into contact with Pakistanis and Indians that there was a slightly different relationship there. Um, but it wasn't something that was over-egged 
too much um in preparation for this podcast i had a look on chinese social media um and what people were saying about india and a lot of it was very predictable things i think you can think of you know um videos of what it's like on this on an indian street you know the all sorts of the services that you get maybe you know barbers or food stores um lots of like tourism like what is it to travel what is it like to travel around india stuff like that mainly um but i think you know it was some in some ways more positive than I expected you know there were people who were saying you know this is a stereotype of India that um there's a stereotype of India being I don't know dirty and backward unsafe for women and then there were influencers going out there and saying actually it's not it's not like that it's not so bad um which was a nice thing to see um but obviously the internet is a is a big place uh Siti just to uh to add to the point that you made about Mao not looking at uh, India despite being a post-colonial country was the fact that you know India was always accused uh, and Nehru was always accused of being actually an inheritor of the colonial uh, colonial British India and so so you know they, they said oh no no India became independent but it is not really post-colonial it is it has inherited the colonial tendencies of Great Britain and I think also the fact that during the uh during the colonial era the Indian soldiers fought or indian co- policemen were deployed in shanghai or were in hong kong etc that created a certain uh, cer- cer- certain problem and followed by the 1962 border crisis yes of course and then obviously the indian um involvement not necessarily willingly in the opium wars uh, as the source of the opium right but again i i don't think i think you know there is a desire to see india as a victim in china in the same way that china sees itself as a victim yeah. but india just doesn't refuses to be put into that box <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true uh, cindy you know uh, I, i don't know if you're aware there's been more than 23000 indian medical students study in china they have not been ra- allowed to travel back so far only south korean and pakistani students have been allowed to return uh, also it may surprise you but hindi films are extremely popular in china that is the second biggest market for them after india for for hindi films and hindi film industry as you know is the biggest film industry in the world in the in the in terms of the number of films that it produces uh, one of the indian actors amir khan has had several hits there you know he's traveled there featured there in various things you know seems to be seems to be rather popular talking to uh, talking to indians who travel to 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 china but despite being geog- geographical neighbors and drawing from the, the the answer which you just gave about the previous question uh, why have the people of two countries not really hit it off you know why do you think is it so yeah i mean i i can only give my best theory it's interesting i i had a look again in preparation for this podcast uh, the top outbound destinations for uh, chinese tourists from china uh, the top 35 doesn't include india <laughs> so people are people are more likely to go to the czech republic chinese people are more likely to go to czech republic as tourism or or to go to um uh, egypt than to go to india and i think that is that is fascinating um i think you know it's it's very hard to say i i did an episode recently of my podcast on china russia relations and what was interesting to hear there was actually the chinese and russians haven't really had that cultural exchange either so i do wonder if partly um while well, it's not in recent years so i do wonder if partly it's just because of a political thing where under you know colonialism or imperialism china was obviously more um had more linkages with the west with the european powers with america uh, with japan as well um then on the communist china china didn't have links with anyone right so it wasn't really a, a india or not thing it was just nobody at all with reform and opening china's looking upwards and looking at um you know influential countries like america where china is despite the politics china has very close cultural links to because that's what you aspire to um and i'm not i'm no expert on on the indian economy but i know that india was going through a very similar stage of growth at the at the same time um which means that china wasn't aspiring to india because china was trying to do what india was already doing but china was looking to america to see how it could be doing better so i think that's one reason for it possibly and another reason is I do think that a lot of China um is the Chinese population society are focused on the eastern edges of the country or the central uh, center of the country not so much in the west which is where um the border with India is shared and so given the han dominated society that China is anyway this 92% of chinese people are han ethnic um who live in the central and eastern borders uh, regions of China people who other countries who interest them more are going to be you know southeast asia like thailand or like japan or like south korea um so that kind of geographical border probably 
you know, buffers things a bit. And I think that's probably similar for Russia, where you've got this vast northern, um, you know, region where it's just not very densely populated at all. So you can understand why uh, people to people linkages are not so much. I think on Bollywood, though, it's interesting that I think Chinese filmmakers would love for their films to be as internationally popular as Bollywood, um, but they haven't quite cracked it yet. But, you know, they would love for it to be like that so i think it is interesting that even though chinese films i think are some of the highest grossing films internationally now but if you actually break down the data that's only because the chinese speaking market is so large majority is chinese speaking viewers still so it hasn't had that international outreach so i think bollywood is a good role model for it in that sense yeah, you spoke about the border area surrounding uh, surrounding india and the actually the two provinces which, saw, which share border with india are tibet uh, and uh, and Xinjiang. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about the Uyghur issue as well as about the Tibet and the Hong Kong issue. The official Indian state perspective on these issues is very different. You know, they are worried about Kashmir, they are worried about treatment of Muslims and other minorities in India. The Indian government doesn't raise any of these issues, unlike the West. You know, there is there is there is this whole sovereignty argument essentially which comes into play. The, Indi the Indian government doesn't want to talk about any of these issues uh, with, with, with China or publicly or in the international uh, sphere. Uh, even though the, the Dalai Lama is based out of India, you know, he lives in India, he operates out of here. I have two questions on this. You know, how should Indians look at these issues, whether it's the Uyghur issue, whether it is Tibet, whether it is Hong Kong, and what do the Chinese outside of Tibet make of the Dalai Lama? Sure. So on your first question, well, Sushant, I really can't tell Indians what they think, but from my perspective, it's my understanding, and please tell me if I'm wrong, that Modi is still quite popular right now that a lot of Indians find him and his strong approach to ethnic minorities in the country, um, they welcome it. So I think in that sense, it's probably a very similar situation to what's happening in China, where the majority ethnicity is saying, well, you either integrate with us, you welcome our way of life, or if you don't, we're going to make your lives difficult. And obviously, I'm not accusing in the Indian government of anywhere near the scale of atrocity that's happening in Xinjiang at the moment. But where it's coming from is probably a very similar place where if you talk to Han Chinese people, you know, um, either they don't know anything about it because of the control of media, or they do know something about it, uh, but they don't care enough about it because they don't know any Uyghurs themselves. They never come across any Uyghurs because let's bear in mind, you know, China is a huge country. So again, it's going to add to that geographical point. If you're on the east or in the center, you're, you don't really go into the west where it's a vast swathe of, um, you know, where the, ethnic, where the Uyghurs tend to live. So that breeds this prejudice and lack of understanding and ignorance about each other, which I, I mean, I, I know that India is a different situation and obviously Muslims and Hindus live more side by side than that. But I think there is a similar kind of desire from a majority ethnicity just to say, we want our country to be this culture. In China, it's not so religious because Han Chinese don't have one religion. They don't have many religions at all. Well, they, a lot of them are Buddhists. Um, but you know, it, even so, it's, it's this kind of racial sectarianism that has come about. So I actually don't think, and I, you know, I wonder what you think, Sushan, if whether or not that's why the Modi government is quite quiet on what's happening in Xinjiang, that, you know, it's kind of similar alienation of the, of the Muslim community. I think Muslims is definitely a factor. The fact that the, that the Uyghurs are Muslims, predominantly Muslims, uh, and uh, Mr. Modi's ruling ideology is Hindu majority in that sense. So that, that, that definitely plays a part. Yeah, yeah, and obviously Modi has not gone nearly as far <laughs> as the Chinese. But how should one look at Tibet and Dalai Lama and and the Hong and Hong Kong? Is there another another side to the story uh, to what the West tries to project it to be? Sure, I mean the Chinese the Chinese version of things would be. Um, you know, I think I think in the West, you often think of Tibet as being overtaken by the communists in the 1950s. But the Chinese would say, actually, Tibet was a part of China before the 1950s. That's what the Chinese would say. Um, and they would look back at the Qing dynasty, which is the last imperial dynasty in China before um, the ab abolition of the, of the imperialism in, in China. Um, and they had taken over Tibet and Xinjiang in very much the way that a lot of this, you know, pre-modern medieval territorial spats happen right you just take over these things and then if you think about how you know Genghis Khan and, and the and the Manchurians the Qing dynasty themselves were not Han Chinese they had fought their way down into China proper from uh, the, the steppes um, in the north so you know these boundaries are fluid they're, they're in flux 
but regardless, at the end of the Qing Dynasty, Tibet and Xinjiang were part of China. And even though, and this, this is really, really um, interesting, this tension here, even though the people who overthrew the Qing Dynasty were Han nationalists and they thought the Qing Dynasty were those Manchurians who had invaded, they wanted to keep the Qing territory. Because if you're going to govern the country, you're going to want to start on the good basis, which is as much territory as possible. And I think I, I'm right in saying that both regions have a lot of natural resources. So even though they wanted to say, we are Han Chinese, this is a Han China, they still wanted all of these you know, <laughs> ethnic minority, non-Han territories. So that's why Chinese today think back to the Qing dynasty as China and to say, you know, Xinjiang and Tibet were ours. And then you obviously have this kind of decades of civil war, of um, warlordism in China between the end of the Qing dynasty and the founding of communist China. And that is when Tibet has a chance to breathe, that Tibet has a chance to create its own state. But when the communists come, they obviously want to reclaim that kind of, um, that kind of territory. I personally find territorial disputes, and I don't know what you think about this, I personally find that them quite hard to justify on either end. You know, I don't think nations have an a priori or an, uh, uh, you know, yeah, an a priori, uh, you know, claim on any piece of land. It really is just realpolitik. And you can say, oh, historically, this, this part was mine. Historically, this part was mine. But historically, parts could be many peoples. <laughs> and I really do think that, you know, what is going to determine what is right now is just really, it is just what's at the barrel of a gun really and um, i'm not saying that's the right way to do it but i do think territories have this kind of created malleable memory we should have we do have a claim to this we do have a claim to that which is often actually not that justifiable on either end um and so i think that's what the probably what the chinese would say about about tibet and obviously what's happened to tibet since i think you can have more conversations about that more moral discussions about that which is you know do you what do you do with ethnic minorities in your country do you allow them to integrate or do you say that they are autonomous regions who can govern themselves but does that actually make them feel even less chinese which is what the government right now thinks um and it's interesting that the former um leader in in the xinjiang region region uh, chen chen guo he had cut his teeth in tibet before so clearly the, the central government in Beijing sees the two regions as very similar problems. And it was because he had done quite well in Tibet that he was promoted to Xinjiang as the new problem. Um, but I, I would say Xinjiang and Tibet are slightly different problems. Um, as for the Dalai Lama, I think, I think China doesn't, I mean, I think China will always protest at any country that hosts the Dalai Lama because it has to, you know, it has to do that in order for it to say that Tibet is its own. Um, and does it believe it? It is almost doesn't matter, I think, because China is never going to let off on that. And I think a lot of Chinese people can see it from that perspective. It's not it's not so much like a human rights issue because it's more of a territory issue. I'm, I'm not, I think there are two issues here, basically, how you treat Tibet and whether or not you think Tibet is a part of China. And you might get Chinese liberals who say, we need to treat Tibet in Xinjiang a different way. But mostly people are going to say it is still part of China. Yeah. And what about Hong Kong? You know, there, there's a view about Hong Kong that China has annexed now Hong Kong. They're, all the human rights have been finished. There are no democratic values there. Is there another side to the story as well on Hong Kong? Well, I mean, the Hong Kong story is, I'd be fascinated to hear more about what the Indian memory of empire is. But the, Hong, but the China's memory of empire is not positive at all. And Hong Kong is the sore point of all of that. It is the beginning of Qing dynasties fall in the unequal treaties. It is, you know, a reminder that at its weakest, China couldn't protect its territories, not just territories that were um, newly fought for under, you know, an ethnic minority government, but also territories that have been China's, you know, and dominated by Han Chinese people. So ethnically, that is much more considered China proper than Tibet and Xinjiang are considered. Um, and that's why the return of Hong Kong, well, I say the return, in English, it's called a handover, right, in 1997. And in Chinese, it's called hui gui, it's called return, because that's how the Chinese see it. They see it as, finally, you're coming. It's not just like a handing over from one actor to another. It's, it's a return. Um, and so that, under one party, one country, two systems, you know, it worked quite well for 15, 20 years. What changed it, I think, is two things. I think it's Xi Jinping himself wanting a personal legacy of being the, the, the general secretary who 
ends all of China's, you know, left and un, you know, untied up, not untied up issues, unsolved issues from empire. And Hong Kong is part of that, and Taiwan is part of that. But what was the most immediate catalyst was the protests in in Hong Kong in in 2019. And obviously, protests have happened in Hong Kong over the 21st century. Every few years, it was student protests. But in 2019, for the first time ever, it got really, really violent. And that for Beijing was catalyst. And it thought, you know, what we're currently doing now, we're not getting Hong Kong back anytime sooner. We've got the West, which is seeing China's rise in Hong Kong as a kind of way to get at China, to, to promote that kind of democracy budding inside China. And we have to cut that. We have to completely control that. And so the national security law, I think, was actually brought forward, you know, faster by the protests. I'm not saying that it would never have come in place. I don't think that one country, two system would really have lasted past 2047 anyway. But Hong Kong was, you know, would say, you know, I thought I would be older when 2047 came about. And so 2047, that's the 50 year grace period with with the basic law. Um, so I think, you know, China was never going to let Hong Kong be one country, two systems for that long. Uh, but what happened in 2019 when that, that date was brought forward, um, you know, as for, you know, is it justifiable? It's interesting because a lot of people in China do have different political opinions. Obviously, it's a country of 1.4 billion people. But on Hong Kong, anecdotally, a lot of people I've spoken to do agree with what's happened there, do agree with the government's approach there. They think that the Hong Kongers are not being patriotic enough. Um, and we, have, we can have a discussion about this idea of loving your country equals loving your government, which the Com Chinese Communist Party have so successfully merged as to the extent that your average man on the street in, in China is not going to necessarily think too much about separating the two. So when they see Hong Kong being opposed to the political system there, they think of them as being impatriotic which is deeply ironic because that's a kind of one party rule that they are subjected to in mainland China themselves and they don't yeah, I mean, I find that cognitive dissonance really fascinating and striking. Um, and they think that, you know, education is the way to do it. They need to have a better, more controlled, patriotic education campaign in the same way I described for the mainland in the 90s. And so that's what you see the government doing now as well. And I think there are a lot of people who also just put all social issues, all political issues down to economics. They think it's a house price problem in Hong Kong. You know, house prices are really, really high, a lot of it because of mainland investors which means that young people um, are disgruntled and they, you know, uh, funnel that disgruntlement into political issues. And so if they solve the economic crisis in Hong Kong, they will also quell that kind of political unrest. Whatever it is, I think the Chinese do, this is not a scientific statement because opinion polls are hard to come by in China, but anecdotally from what the Chinese people that I've spoken to, they're quite supportive of what's happened, um, what ha the government has done in Hong Kong. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. You mentioned the President Xi's personality, you know, and this is something else. Also, I wanted to ask you about. We hear a lot about President Xi's personality driving Chinese policy, particularly foreign policy. Also, two more issues I wanted to ask you about. How should people in India, our listeners, look at these two issues as well? One is President Xi's personality. Another is Han nationalism, you know, which is spoken about a lot. And the third thing which interests a lot of Indians, but they really don't understand it well, is this great firewall of China that keeps it technologically secluded, but still technologically very advanced. You know, what are the, what are the assumptions and how do you, you know, break through those assumptions when you look at these three issues? Well, on the Great Firewall, isn't it the case that uh, the Indian government has banned a lot of Chinese apps? Not really. They're, they're, they're on the, they're, it was more of optics to show to the people that we have acted against China for what it has done on our territory in Ladakh, but not really more than that. That's interesting. So people can still download it. Yeah, you know, people can download it. Or not, not really people that people can download, but they were not really the, the, the majority of, uh, of, of apps were still available. So uh, some of the, um, the, I think the most prominent uh, app which went away was TikTok. Yeah, yeah. So, so in India, you can't use TikTok, and then you have various Indian versions of TikTok that have uh, that that have come in. Well, I guess it's similar to that with the Great Firewall, which is that if you ban an app, you have a domestic version coming up, right? And um, just because uh, you ban something doesn't mean Chinese people don't have access to that service provided by someone else. So you have copycats all the time. Um, I think China has particular advantage in that because the market is just so big, um, having one point four billion people. I think half of whom have smartphones it means you almost don't really need an international market for your tech to be good because you can grab all of the data domestically and you can have all of the um, market you 
you could possibly really service inside the Great Firewall itself. And so you've got the equivalent apps, um, and often they're better. TikTok in China is better than TikTok in the West. Douyin, which is the um, original Chinese app, you can buy things on there. It's an e-commerce app as well as a streaming service. Um, so and and it all becomes this great ecosystem and network. Um, so yeah, I, I remember when I went to China. I actually think China's smartphone revolution is fascinating because it actually came about so much faster than、um, in the West. So in London, London today, people are getting used to QR codes now because of COVID, and you scan something, you order at your table. That was happening in China eight years ago. <laughs>、um, like it was not not that that's like a marker of progress necessarily. It's just a bit of a gimmick at the end of the day. But I remember going back in、um, six years ago. I remember going back in 2016 with my、um, boyfriend, and we were at a restaurant, and I looked Chinese, and I was just like, "Why are we not getting served?" And eventually, I pluck up the courage to ask someone, and they said, "Oh, you just scan this thing on the table. You order on your phone." I was like,、mm. "What?" And I had never heard of anything like that before. So I was I was really embarrassed because they looked at me like I was an alien, which I was because I hadn't been back to China, hadn't done that before.、Um, so in that sense, you know, Chinese live a very digital life.、Um, On Xi Jinping's personality, But,、uh, I think. See if I can go back on the digital part、hmm. of it.、Uh, so when you travel to China, when you want to access your Twitter account or your Gmail account or your Facebook or Insta or what have you,、uh, how difficult is it, even with a VPN? You know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people talk about, oh, you can use a VPN and access all this, all these、uh, platforms, all these uh, uh, websites. Uh, how you?、Uh, how difficult is it for someone like you or anyone going from going from、uh, from abroad? So.、Um... Before, because of COVID, I haven't been back in almost three years. But、uh, when I, the last time I was back, you know, before COVID,、uh, in two thousand nineteen, it was relatively easy. You can download a VPN or, or one that you pay for, which is more reliable, and then you can basically just get everything. I personally was a bit cautious because, as a journalist, I was traveling also through Hong Kong in August twenty、yeah. nineteen. <laughs> so I was like, maybe、yeah. I just. I'll just delete Twitter on my phone anyway. <laughs> so I was being a bit cautious,、um, mm-hmm. but yeah, you can just access these things. But、um, what I've heard is that since then, VPNs have become much harder to have. Foreigners are really thinking about leaving China right now. You know, I've got foreign friends or foreign colleagues who are in China, and the environment is not good right now. It's they feel like they are being. Um, they are not welcome, basically, and and part of that is because VPNs are harder to come by.、Um, and、uh, what was I going to say?、Uh, and I think oh yeah, yeah. The other thing is that m- me as an outsider going in, I know what a VPN is. I know what is in the outside world in terms of the digital world. If you're a Chinese person born and bred, you might not really have an interest in getting a VPN and seeing what's on Twitter and what's on Facebook. You have to be really kind of technologically apt. Or really, kind of interested in the West or the outside world, in order to do that, you could because for all of the information, all of the、um, popular culture, and all of the、um, anything that you really want to access, you can get it on Chinese internet. So they, most people don't have a desire to do that,、um, but of course there are people who who do, and I've interviewed a few of them. And in Chinese, it's called fan chang, which is leaping the wall, and it's a euphemism for getting out of the firewall. Um, and a lot of young people do do that, but older people, less educated people, people who are not interested, you know, they don't do it.、Um, and then on the personality front, I think that point can be overegged、um, because he's a very elusive character. We really don't know much about his personality at all. Does he have? Is he patient? Is he short-tempered? Is he、um, humorous? Is he selfish? We, we literally we don't know nothing about this president at all, really. And what we do know is what we can gather from you know bits here and there. So, for example, in Desmond Shum,、um, so Desmond Shum is a businessman who worked in China in the early noughties, and he has written a memoir recently called Red Roulette、uh, about his time doing business in China. And he's Hong Kong Chinese, and he his wife was very close to Wen Jiabao, who was the then premier. She has since disappeared. Taken by the Chinese state because of certain corruption things, and she, he thinks that she hasn't apologized for the, these things, and that's why she hasn't been let out yet. Anyway, he's written the memoir about all of this, and he has a front row seat to all of these. And in there, there's a little vignette of his wife going to have dinner with Xi Jinping and Peng Liyuan, who was his wife before he became,、um, before he even went onto the standing committee, I think it was. And what was interesting was that he noted that. 
there was no gossip about them. They were very, you know, they were very dignified. They didn't say much. They didn't reveal much about themselves. They were perfectly pleasant, but there was nothing memorable that his wife could remember about that conversation. There was no um, leverage that she could get off that conversation. So she, they're clearly very, very cautious people. And so this lack of understanding about his personality, I think, is cultivated. He doesn't want people to know about him because, um, you know, it's, it's a protection mechanism. And I think that's why I think it can be over egged because we really have no positive proof that it's because Xi Jinping is a vain person, for example, that he wants to do this. What we can say is that his political opinions are clearly very nationalist. Um, he grew up in the Cultural Revolution where he suffered a lot. Um, his dad was um, a very senior communist cadre. Um, so he's grown up, he's a, known as a princeling. He's a second generation communist. And I think that comes across basically in what he does. He really, really clearly cares about the party, he puts it first. He cares about China being led by the party. Um, but I think, you know, when we say that it's all C, or when we say that had we had China had a different leader, things might be different, we forget actually how much the party itself matters to him. And we forget how much the party itself will have input on all of these things. And I think we also underestimate how nationalistic China as a country and as a government is turning in general. So it's not just this one man from the top down saying we need to do this and that. It's actually a lot of people supporting him doing, doing that. So we need to understand that in order to understand that about the country. And, and one thing that this is important to understand is because, you know, if China was a democracy, what kind of democracy would it be? Because what is the public opinion of the people? Could it actually be more awful to the ethnic minorities than it actually currently is at the moment? Because that's what the majority might vote for. So it's, I think it's interesting to know how much Xi Jinping is a creation of a institution of systems around him rather than just one man top down giving setting down the law on everyone else. Um, and, and your other questions about Han nationalism, which I kind of touched on as well, um, which, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a slightly different problem because the Han are ninety two percent of China, so Han nationalism often doesn't have the opportunity to show itself because it doesn't have a contrasting view. <laughs> Because you can live in China all your life and never meet a non-Han person. So it's, Han nationalism doesn't come out necessarily in the in kind of um, discrimination or anything like that. Um, actually, maybe let me let me rephrase that because when when I've talked to Uyghurs and Hui Muslims and other ethnic minorities traveling around China, they have said that they felt discriminated against, whether or not it's you know it's a, I guess it's a bit like. Um, any ethnic minority might feel in a, in a relatively racist country, which is that, you know, you might be denied service at a hotel or that kind of thing. So that does happen. And I will fully check my privilege here that I'm a Han Chinese. So I don't know what it is like to live in China as an ethnic minority. Um, but having said that, I think a lot of Han nationalism right now doesn't have, it isn't ending people to people pogroms or anything like that. But instead it's promoting a Chinese-ness that is dominated by what the Han think are Chinese-ness. Um, obviously always fuzzy around the edges, but it's going to be things like Hanfu, which is making a return, which is Han Dynasty uh, clothing um, from, you know, like a thousand years ago because of a way of saying, recalling to a China that doesn't, did, wasn't invaded by the Mongolians and the Manchurians, and that's Han nationalism. Um, but that's relatively aesthetic sense of it. It's not, it's not dangerous, I would say. It's not a um, malicious way of doing things. Um, but I think Han nationalism is obviously much more malicious when it comes to Xinjiang, because what is the problem with the people living there if you say that ethnic minorities are Chinese? You know, if you say that you can have a Muslim minority, then you should be allowing them to have halal food or to wear headscarves or to grow beards. But I think a lot of people who interpret Han nationalism in a malicious way don't think that that's Chinese at all. But they would say they call themselves Chinese nationalism, and that's the problem, right? Because they they would say that what this Chinese identity is dominated by the Han. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not sure if that's a very good answer to your question, but um, yeah, Cindy, that's very true. The, the the biggest danger with any majoritarian ethnic nationalism is that it is mistaken for country's nationalism. You know, Han nationalism is seen as Chinese nationalism. Hindu nationalism can be seen as Indian nationalism. You know, white nationalism can be seen as American nationalism. Right, you, know, you, can, right. you can easily mistake it to be the to be the national thing because it is so dominant 
dominant and so visible everywhere, uh, where minorities are all marginalized. That, that's the big danger there. But moving on, Cindy, to, to something which I was very curious to know, what are the best cultural markers of modern China? You know, I'm talking about you know, you know, TV shows, OTT shows, films, music, podcasts, trends that you would like to highlight and recommend to our listeners, but primarily Indians. I think that I would recommend uh, The Three-Body Problem as a trilogy of sci-fi books. Really, really excellent series uh, written by a man called Liu Cixing. And I think that book just really kind of, it does embody a lot of people's political relationships, which is that there's a part in there which is incredibly it's relatively subversive because it's talking about the Cultural Revolution and it's talking about, you know, one of the premises is that one of the main characters hates humanity because of her experiences in the Cultural Revolution. That's pretty subversive to say. Obviously, the Chinese Party has, Chinese Communist Party has recognised it's a mistake. But even so, to be colourful about it um, and to really labour the point, I think is interesting. At the same time, because it's sci-fi, it goes into the future and it doesn't see China as a different beast to other nations. And it does see China as taking quite a leading role, but not jingoistic at all. And it is just depoliticized in that way, in a very, you know, very nice way. And I honestly, I'm a I'm quite I quite enjoy sci-fi. And I think it's one of the best sci-fi books I've ever re- read. That's even including the Western books that I've read. And so I would really recommend that because China is not just politics. Um, I would Unfortunately, a lot of Chinese TV shows these days are not very good. (laughs) And I will say that um, because I think that there's just a lot of um, dross around. There's a lot of soap and that sort of stuff around. Um, One thing that was recently quite popular is called Not Yet 30, um, which is about these three women living in Shanghai, touching 30 and their different lives. One is a mother, one is a career woman, one is a newly married and possibly thinking about being a mother. And it's a very cosmopolitan look at what it is like to be a modern woman in China today, which is quite a nice, I think, view that we often don't see outside. Um, Then I would recommend um, a film as well, which is more historical, if I may, which is Farewell, My Concubine. And I think... um, to go back to that painful history that China has been under, obviously the Chinese Communist mm-hmm. Party would like to say that that painful history ended in 1949 when they took over, but it really didn't. Um, and Farewell My Concubine tells the story of 20th century China so well. It's not about concubines at all. Um, it just It's about these two main characters, two men who grow up as Beijing opera singers, and they go into this dancing troupe in 1910s in China, and it's about their lives throughout the 20th century. And told through the lives of just two ordinary people, you see all of the political uproar that happens in the background, which really goes to show that the paint, the century of humiliation definitely did not end in 1949. Um, but I think to understand modern China and to understand why 21st century China is so different to uh, why a lot of people in, in 21st century China actually think their lives are quite good. You have to see what the alternative, what the previous comparison is. And that's why that film is really, really good as well. And also I think it's quite good because there's also um, it's a homosexual undertone to that film, which I think is interesting because it shows a certain liberalism in Chinese filmmakers, certainly of a certain generation, which I think is interesting as well. Um, there's a whole question about whether or not these filmmakers can still make similar films yeah. today. But <laughs> yeah, uh, and Cindy, before finally, you know, uh, other than Chinese whispers, any other podcast that you listen to or would recommend uh, our, our listeners to listen to to understand get a better get a better understanding of contemporary China? So I think my favorite Chinese podcast is probably um, so the Seneca podcast that Kaiser Kuo does in Sub for Ch- Sub China. Uh, over in America and I think he does a very similar thing which is just talk about you know he doesn't shy away from politics he doesn't shy away from the important issues about the western China's power struggle but also at the same time it's all about those other things that make China so interesting so a recent episode I listened to of his was about authoritarian resilience why is it that authoritarian states are much more resilient than anyone ever gives them credit for from the outside and his guest has surveyed people in China and about their public opinion, about their opinions of the of the state, which I think is fascinating to hear because anecdotally, I know that to be true, which is that a lot of Chinese people are relatively supportive of the government. But this was an academic who was able to bring up his um, research in support of that. So I think that's a very good podcast. And there are all sorts of amazing podcasts about Chinese history, 
um, about uh, China's role in Africa, um, all these sort of things, which are, you know, very definitely worth looking into as well. Yeah, uh, th- thank you so much, Cindy. This was wonderful talking to you. It was really enlightening and interesting. We really enjoyed talking to you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you to our listeners for for listening to this podcast. For more information on our work, follow us on Twitter at CPR underscore India and log on to our website at www.cprindia.org.